Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're tuning into an episode of the Redefining Society Podcast, hosted by Marco Cipelli. Let's face it, the future is now. We live in a hybrid analog digital society, and we must stop ignoring it or pretending that technology is not affecting us. The line between the physical and virtual worlds has become a figment of our imagination. On it, we are continually performing a dangerous balancing act juggling convenience, privacy, freedom, security, technology, society, culture, and even the future of humanity. There is no better place than here, and no better time than now, to muse on our relationship with technology and how to redefine what society means in this new age. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. Hello, this is Marco Ciappelli on Redefining Society podcast. Uh, today, we are going to talk about a topic that if you have been following me for a while, you know I always say this. I wish we didn't have to talk about this or why are we still talking about this, which is diversity and inclusion and all those beautiful words that many times are not followed by the talk it's just uh, you know by the walk it's just a talk but uh, the truth is that uh, I wanted to host this conversation on redefining society and not on a cybersecurity infosec channel because it is pretty much a societal issue and it's very much connected with technology and the, the world and the industry of cybersecurity I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other industry but technology and cybersecurity is what we focus the most, what we know the most, what, uh, you know, Sean and I have been connected. And we've been connected, actually, with, with, the, with this organization for, for a long time. I visited uh, when it did happen in Las Vegas, I think it was 2019. And, uh, and I got the opportunity to meet some of these amazing people in person. And a lot has been changed since then. So today we're going to catch up. Uh, learn about the Diane Initiative with Nicole. Hi, Nicole. How are you today? Hey, I'm Nicole Schwartz. I'm currently the COO for Diana Initiative, uh, which just means that I do all the things. Uh, <laughs> and I am also, during my day job, a product manager at Active State. Uh, and I've been with Diana Initiative uh, three or four years. I can't really keep track anymore because the pandemic made everything squishy. Yes, it sure did. It sure did. So thank you for already done the introduction. So we're over with that. Now we can start talking about the initiative itself. And and. Woot. We just finished the the main event, let's say the main course, <laughs> which is what happened uh, in Las Vegas during uh, Hacker Summer Camp. Uh, it happened every year, except for the pandemic. Although I think we happened happen online. It. Yep, it still happen. Thank you, uh, technology. And uh, and so I know that the whole concept, and I'm going to get you started with that happened in 2015 and I'm saying this because it's when ITSP magazine started and at the time we were already saying why do we have with this diversity and inclusion problem and here we are but a lot has happened so I would love for you to give an introduction for the the public that doesn't even maybe know about the Diana initiative Uh, we hope they know about the issue but uh, yeah, an introduction, a little history on what it is, what you guys do, and why it's so important that you do this. 
So our founders um, were having lunch together at DEF CON. Uh, so for anybody who doesn't know, Hacker Summer Camp is a whole bunch of events that happen in Las Vegas and everybody goes and spends the week there. And they were talking about issues that came up being a underrepresented gender minority. And they were like, we can't have these conversations in a lot of the rooms because there's too many people who don't look like us. It would be really nice if there was a space where people just look like us and we could discuss the problems that we're having because we're not the majority. And that kind of spouted the idea for the event. And the event was originally more of just like a sweet party. So for anyone familiar with a lot of groups like the DC groups who get together and rent a suite and everybody hangs out together because they're local, same concept. It's meet people who are where you are and then go out into DEF CON. So for anybody who has not been to DEF CON, it's a large event. Think like Comic Con or Dragon Con. There's a lot of people there. And if it's your first time or nobody there looks like you, it's a bit intimidating. But if you had the opportunity to go like to a sweet party, socialize with some people, make a friend and then go, it's a lot less intimidating and a bit more fun. And so for the first few years, that's really what it was. And people kept saying, hey, can you add talks? Can you add this and the other? And so there was hands-on activities, talks, and it just got to the point that it was so big, the fire marshal kept shutting us down, which is not good. You don't want the fire marshals shutting you down. And so we had to find a bigger space. So we kind of became our own event next door at the Westin. And so it is like a very short walk. If you walk from the food court, which is where actually everybody originally started the idea, across the street to the Westin, it's like five, seven minutes. And we have talks and villages and workshops and all sorts of cool stuff. And we happen at the beginning of Hacker Summer Camp. We've experimented. We've tried happening at the beginning, the middle, you know, slightly toward the end. And I think the beginning actually went pretty well for especially our purposes of everyone meeting one another. And so this year we were at the very beginning on Monday and it allowed people to like come in, meet one another, make buddies, and then go to the rest of the events throughout the week, like Black Hat. We had 20 student scholars this year. We joined with Black Girls Hack. And so together we raised enough money to send 20 people to the whole of Hacker Summer Camp, covered like part of their travel, their hotels, et cetera, et cetera. And it just made their lives a little bit smoother because they knew they had friends. They knew they had a discord that they could ping people. Uh, and I think it worked out pretty well and we're gonna probably keep up with that trend yeah, and actually, you mentioned the Black Girls Hack. We we I had a conversation with with them before actually uh, Hacker Summer Camp, and uh, they this year they had their own uh, their own event outside of DEF CON. I mean, we're not going to go into the reason why, but they did. And uh, it, the description of how the Diana Initiative evolved is is very typical in in some in the term of you kind of connect with the same people that have the same issue they feel they feel the way you feel right and then sometimes it ends there but at least you can support each other and sometimes it's such a create an echo chamber because the problem is really big it's like you realize it's not just you it's not just me it's it's a bunch of us it's a bunch of everybody and so when the fire marshal shuts you down. I think it's a good sign. I mean, it's not a good thing. <laughs> it's a good sign, right? You know you're in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. So how, I mean, apart from the fact that obviously you're doing the right thing, I know you're growing you're more and more volunteers member. And again, let's remind, this is an all volunteers type of situation here. Why do you think that you, the Diana Initiative has been so successful? Like, is it lesson learn you, you say you try different things maybe do it at the beginning at the end that you know what, what how do you find out what works and what doesn't and how do you recruit more people so we do a lot of surveys um so anyone who buys a ticket gets a survey to our event um and they we ask them about things that happened this year and things they'd like to see in the future and we really honestly dig through that feedback because as a volunteer org and as an org meant for the community, there's no point in us in existing. And one of our questions specifically is, do you feel we're fulfilling our mission? Uh, and 
everyone usually answers yes. And I hope that trend continues because we try to be like, how do we support the community? Our goal is to increase the number of underrepresented groups in information security. Pretty straightforward. Are we raising up new speakers' voices? We have CFP training. We have uh, first-time speaker training. Are we helping people get jobs? We have a career fair and a career village. You know, are we doing everything we absolutely can? And like, we're open to ideas for more stuff. And so if you look at a lot of other events, I think there's a couple conferences that are meant for new people. But a lot of conferences, like Women's Cyber Jitsu is great. They have a ton of beginner content. I love them. Um, but then there's also a lot of conferences that just assume you've already gotten into the industry or you're already in for a couple of years, which is great. We need those. We need conferences for people in the middle and you know who are trying to get into upper management. But we're trying to focus on, okay, do you feel alone? Let's find you buddies. Let's refer you to some of our community partners like Black Girls Hack or Latinas in Cyber. And also let's mentor you and get you so that you get to that first conference or that you get that first job. So you're not in the group of people anymore who is a beginner, that you can go to the conferences where you're supposed to have one or two years experience. And so we're kind of the training wheels, or at least I see us as the training wheels. And we partnered with Black Girls Hack this year. Um, we tried to partner with more organizations. We really want to partner with everyone possible so that we can feed people into these other organizations. Like, I love that people are with us for multiple years, but you shouldn't be our target audience for a long period of time. You should be able to switch over to being on the mentor side. Like, you should be able to mentor those new speakers or mentor those new CFP people or tell people like, hey, I can teach you how to solder or I can teach you how to do this, you know, capture the flag thing. Yeah, and for those that are not familiar with this, because I, I wanted I wanted to bring this on redefining society because we start with the cybersecurity, but I want to make it a little bit wider in terms of conversation. But they probably have a lot of people listening to you and say, you know, like, okay, so soldering, you know, it's related with budgets and some other things, uh, hacking, lock picking. So, you know, I want to make sure that people understand that this is all about cybersecurity and what what entails. Like if going to DEF CON, it's, uh, it's quite an adventure the first time you go there. And to be honest, quite overwhelming. If you don't have friends, if you don't have a community that you can refer to and that initiate you to have a really good experience there. So the whole industry, why do you think it's so, I mean, why do you think on a certain level, it's not welcoming anymore? Oh, but God. <laughs> at, the, at the lower level, I have to be honest, I, because of my job and talking to so many people in the industry, I mean, I love this community so much. And I feel like maybe I just talked to the welcoming people. <laughs> What's the story there? I mean, so, and this is not unique to cyber. It's not no, even unique exactly. to IT. Um, so a lot of the research I've read, way too much research, I like pay to get academic research because I'm that kind of person. It applies to STEM, all of STEM really. Mm. So because there has been certain attitudes and like, if you roll back in your head 10 or 15 years, we've both been in the industry that long, there used to be booth babes where they would hire mm. just attractive ladies to stand at the booths. And so the industry set itself up. If let's go stereotypical, this is not exactly correct, but everybody put in their head, like that whole mad men thing where mm -hmm. a whole bunch of marketing guys were like, we're the marketing guys for tech companies. We're going to put pretty ladies, but the pretty ladies can't answer the tech questions. And so you, you've started having the industry where, a, that makes it so when people go up and talk to a lady like me when I'm in a booth, they're like, and can I talk to the technical person? In a lot of cases, I am the technical person, but they've been previously trained that that's not the case. So on the one hand, you can blame them. On the other hand, we kind of set ourselves up for that. Also in the workplace, because in a lot of cases, like most of the jobs I've had, when especially when I was younger, I was the only lady there and it was all men. Um, in my current job, there's three ladies, but it's still mostly guy programmers. And that sometimes, it only takes one bad apple to bring about bad habits. 
And so if anyone's unfamiliar with the term microaggressions, like it may not seem like a bad workplace, but there may just be little things that are constantly glue work, making the ladies always do the glue work or just the underrepresented people do the glue work or just constantly not thinking to include people. Because a lot of times we don't even do it on purpose. We look for people just like Diana Initiative started because we were looking for people that look like us. At your workplace, you may be looking for people that look like you and you may think of them first. And if you think of them first, are they going to get the raises first? Are they going to get the promotions first? Are they going to get the opportunities first? So even if it's not malicious, you have a lot of people who are already at a disadvantage. And this is all the fields. And the great thing is all the research that has been done is that if you let people be aware of the fact there are these unconscious biases and they don't make that person a bad person, that they just have to pause and think. Like when I was at GitLab, I was like, hey, I've read up all your notes from an interview. Take a minute do a meeting, you know, whatever, come back in an hour, read through, remove anything that is not relevant to the position, then reconsider. And just that process of checking your own self for biases can remove a lot of biases. You don't necessarily need all sorts of fancy tools or technology to help you mitigate biases. You just need people who genuinely are like, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to take a break and then I'm going to reread my notes and be like, does that really matter for this job position? No, let's remove that. It didn't matter that they were a homemaker or that they took a year off. No big deal. They've got the the skills. Let's bring them in anyway. Mm. And I love that because by doing that, you create it, you create a pattern and then eventually turn into cultural change because yep. the fear that I always have is many beautiful initiative. A lot of people want to check you know, Mark, uh, been there, I listened, so now I'm right there, I'm supporting. No, no you're not, <laughs> you know, you got to do something. So I'm connecting here with the theme for this year event, which is uh, lead the change. So let, let's talk about that. Like what happened when you want to tell people and how do you tell people, empower people to lead the change? you do not need to be in power to lead the change. I have rarely been a manager at any job I'm at. And I definitely leave my mark, whether people like it or not, on everywhere that I go. Just like you said, it takes small changes to change culture. Just be that small change. Do you have an employee resource group? No. Start one. Tell the company we don't need any funding. I just need one hour each month and we're going to have an ERG. Start an ERG. If that's not your jam, how about you make sure like, hey, I am a person who participates in interviews. I'm going to review our interview process and I'm going to make small incremental suggestions for how to reduce bias. It doesn't need to cost money. You don't need tools. You can literally, like I said, read a whole bunch of research. And if anyone wants the research, like just Google around for it to add in a pause, like take your notes immediately after the meeting, because that's very important. But then take like a short pause. Don't like come back two days later. You're going to forget everything. Like an hour or two. And then come back and read it. So just introduce those small things. Making sure the questions in the job interview are relevant to the job. That you don't have any miscellaneous bullshit questions. Everybody knows those. You've been in an interview and they ask you like what letter of the alphabet you would be. Like that's not going to help anyone. Like take that thing out. Um, so maybe you don't participate in interviews. Maybe you don't feel like you represent a group that could be part of an ERG. Can you in your meetings, pay attention and see if certain people are getting talked over constantly. Can you be the bull and be like, hey, you just talked over so-and-so, can they finish their point? Be the rude person. Like, or if you can't be rude, circle back later and be like, yeah, like so-and-so was originally saying and just like do that subtle passive aggressive thing. If more people get recognized for what they're saying, that's going to help their voices be heard. There is something everyone can do. I don't care if you're like brand new to the company one day. If you're brand new to the company one day and you're onboarded and you notice that the onboarding process is very confusing and upsetting, is that because you're neurodivergent? Can you help them improve the process so it works for neurodivergent and neurotypical people? Like there is something every person at every company can do to help people be more inclusive of people with disabilities, people with different thought patterns, people of different genders and races and religions. Like, does the company give off for Christmas and not have like a flexible holiday day for everybody else who's a different religion? Like, 
why don't you recommend that for the next year's things? Like, hey, you have Christmas off. Can we just give everybody one other day to apply to one of their religions, you know, things? And so I guess that's my personal thing is I've always been a bull in a China shop. Like, just pick <laughs> one thing and do it, you know, like lead the change. It does. You don't need to be a manager. You don't need to be yeah. a director. You don't need to be a VP. Whoever you are, you can do something unless you are that underrepresented person that's constantly getting talked over in which case maybe you need to find a buddy to help call out when you're getting stomped all over in meetings you know right and you and it's a good thing to participate to the kind of event like the one that you have and that's what i meant by empowering not not power meaning c-level position but empowering meaning you know inspiration getting that inspiration and knowing that if you do something somebody else is probably going to join you because you're you know, you think you're the only one, but probably you're not. So let, let's talk a little bit about the, this year event. So what happened? So speakers, any notable thing that you want to highlight? Oh, so much stuff. Um, okay, so let's do it. We let's had go. Tanya Janka talking <laughs> as our keynote Tanya, speaker. Yeah. Hi, Tanya. And that was securing, shifting security everywhere. Because we've talked about shifting security left or right or wherever. She talked about shifting it everywhere. Uh, so that was a great talk. And we will be having our recorded talks pop up starting in September. So anybody who missed the event, feel free to uh, watch it. Um, there were three separate speaking tracks. So we're literally filling every single day of the month of September with a new talk. So uh, as long as I work fast enough, <laughs> I am the video editor. So, oh, um, it's so new. Okay. I, I, like I said, CMO I get that feeling. So I, I know the pain. I feel the pain. Yeah. So I'm hoping I've got like at least a week or two already. So we're doing good for the first part. We'll see if we keep going. Uh, we had three different villages. Maker Village is always super popular. It's where you get to learn to solder and solder your badges and everything. We also have like coloring and crafting and knitting. So it's not just about soldering. It's a Maker Village. Um, we are hoping to kind of keep expanding that. We had our lock picking village by Lock Pick Extreme. As usual, they are lovely people and always like come on out. And people, there's that moment when you see people figure out like, oh shit, this is the same lock on my front door. It's a great moment. Uh, and we also had our career village, and that was where people could do mock interviews, resume reviews, and they helped about 42 different people. So that was great. We did have a career fair this year because everyone kept saying, have a career fair, have a career fair. It was kind of a little empty. Uh, there was like a couple sponsors who were like banging it up and talking to a lot of people. But I think uh, we may need to review the feedback and the career fair may have to go by the wayside because we've tried it a couple different ways and it's just, it's not working. So anybody who did attend, don't forget to do your feedback. We really do read it and it helps inform our stuff every year. And we had three workshops. This was our first year for workshops. Ghost Cat was in charge of workshops. It was great. We had Black Hoodie come and teach reverse engineering. We had uh, JP Morgan Chase do an after the ARR workshop, as well as an active directory workshop. And all the feedback on the workshops was phenomenal. Um, a lot of people complained that they missed talks to go to the workshops, but the talks are recorded, so I feel like it's okay. Um, so we'll see about that. Um, overall, though, it was 85 volunteers helping about 470 registrants find their way around, learn stuff, make friends, and uh, a very busy hallway with our sponsors and community partners. There were 72 different sponsors who came, uh, and hopefully everyone had really good conversations with them. Um, a comment I see continually on social media and other places is because we're so small, you can actually have real conversations with people. As opposed to at DEF CON, I know a lot of time I'm doing like the hi, and then you like talk with someone for three seconds, and then you like cut off, and then, you know, that's it. That's all you get to talk to them. Um, and like I had mentioned, we had 20 joint scholarship winners for Black Girls Hack and Diana Initiative, where they got um, Black Hat tickets, DEF CON tickets, Squad Con tickets, Diana Initiative tickets, B-Side Las Vegas tickets for half of them. We ran out of money to get the other half. Maybe next year, everyone can get B-Side Las Vegas tickets as well. So I'm trying to think. Oh, goodness. We had our party. Um, QueerCon came to our party. Um, that was like a last minute scramble. I'm hoping we can plan a little bit earlier next year because we would love to have like the DC Furs and the QueerCon and everybody else come because obviously we're all inclusive uh, and the QueerCon folks are just fabulous. So I love them and all their stuff. So next year, hopefully they can, we can plan it out a little bit better, but we play board games and Legos. So if you're like used to the uns uns parties, 
We are not Nun Swans party. <laughs> we are we are Legos and board games party. So we're like the low key chill party, which so, I like. Uh, yeah, of course I do too. It so, sounds like in uh, in line with a maker village. Like you actually, even when you're partying, you're making something. You're making the Lego. You're playing, and that that's great interaction anyway. So I, I like to highlight that because a lot of people, and I had this conversation with for many years when the, the first reaction when they see a a group of people that say well i want to be all inclusive but then i'm going to call myself latina who hucks or black girls uh the diana initiative anybody i need to highlight and i want you to help me doing this because they i this group, they, they need a name. They identify. That's how it starts. But the name does not define the group. And this collaboration that you mentioned, I think it's really, really important to understand. And in my opinion, the more these groups and the more you guys come together, uh, that's a good sign. So... I definitely do want to plot more with all of the groups because uh, I know that we're all overworked and we're all 100% volunteer run. And I forgot to mention we had Hacker Trivia. So for the trivia nerds, we have a bunch of trivia and prizes. Um, but yeah, Black Girls Hack welcomes people who are not Black and not girls. Uh, Latinas in Cyber, I believe, is also pretty inclusive. I know that we're inclusive. We did start out as femme, but now it's like, we don't care who you are. We want everybody. We're mm -hmm. also open to allies. Um, some groups do try and keep themselves just to their core group, not including allies, but we welcome allies as well because we need allies and people to make stuff happen. And so, yeah, when you first start a group, you pick a name at the moment. And then once you lock into a name, I don't know anyone who's started a business, but if you've done that, you know that once you do all the trademarks and copyrights and whatever, you're like, I'm not doing that again. Uh, and so you're kind of you're kind of stuck. And so um, we have definitely considered changing our name, but like at this point we have name recognition and we don't want to lose that. And we also can't think of something that's better. So one thing that Jamie and myself have been plotting and hopefully we get better at is kind of like you said, we want to work closer with Black Girls Hack and Latinas in Cyber and WISP and everybody else so that maybe we have one big event that somebody is the headliner or whatever that signs mm -hmm. the contracts, but everybody shows up to. So that it's clear that everybody's welcome. Because if you say like, hey, we're having the Hacker Summer Camp kickoff hosted by Diana Initiative, but also has all of these other groups, right. then everybody realizes, hey, we're welcome because QueerCon's there and DC Furs are there and everybody else. And that's what I would love to get to is having all of these other community groups totally invited to do whatever they want at our event. You know, just let us know in advance and we'll carve out space for them. Yep. I love it. And I'm imagining, I don't know, I'm very creative brain and visualizing like what a DEF CON with all the villages. It could be a, all the villages that are all welcoming and inclusive and all together. It's, you know, it's a small world after all, and, but we're all together and, and with, with all the, the difference that there are there. And we just need to make it more clear and a better job. And I'm talking to everybody that has a microphone, that has a platform to sometimes it's, you know, it even if you have three people that listen to your show, I hope I have more than that. But even if you, who cares? Even one person that changed their mind, a person that joined, a person that get initiatives and uh, and lead the change. It's it's a big, big deal. So as we're wrapping here, I want you to tell us what's next, which is my favorite thing to ask. The future. <laughs> what's going oh, on? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're a 100% volunteer organization. We currently have posted um, on all of our social medias and everywhere a call for staff and a call for board members. Now the call is out there. We're ignoring the call for the next month or two. So if you don't hear from us, don't worry yet. But the process that happens is the event is wrapping up. We're finishing up everything. We're doing our hot wash. We're gonna prep for next year. And part of prepping for next year is a lot of our staff members are gonna be like, I do not have time for this. Or I, as a board member, I don't have time for this. And so we're gonna have a lot of openings. 
And we need people for those open staff positions and those open board positions. So if you have time, and I'm gonna put in a caveat here, this is a 12 month a year job. And I am not exaggerating when I say that some people like Marie, our scholarship lead, was putting in one to two hours a day, every single day, all year. So you need to have time. Uh, if you have less time than that, board. So if you have any board experience or if you want board experience, our board uh, meets four times a year or tries to meet four times a year. So that's a way lower commitment. But you do have to kind of have some finance experience or at least be willing to go like maybe take a class on finance and stuff. And then finally, if you're like, okay, I really want to help, but I can't do either one of those things. Um, fill out our 2024 feedback survey, which is on social media to help us inform next year and then volunteer to do day of work. And that's just literally like the day before, day of, and day after. We need set up, we need tear down, and we need people the day of. And so if that's your level of commitment, that is also awesome. I think we had about 85 people this year doing all that running around. And so you can get yourself on that list. Other than that, if you want to help teach a class for our members, I know that I'm interested in trying to get a class on negotiation or like what is stock, like RSUs. Um, because a lot of people, if this is their first tech job, they're like, what is an RSU? What do I value it at? Do I care if I get it? Um, and so we want to have like some of those courses for our members uh, throughout the year up through the event. So if you are a teacher and you're willing to donate or give us a super good discount, also reach out. All right. So definitely a call to action to become part of the initiative. And uh, I'm assuming there'll be an event again next year. So I, there better too, be <laughs> too early, though, to ask you, you know, who you have in mind or all of that. But we will put a link, obviously, to the Diana Initiative dot uh, org uh, URL, any resources you want to share with us, any links to all your social media and all of that. Please send it over and we will include it in the notes for everybody listening and everybody that want to get to know what you guys do. And uh Again, it's a commitment. Volunteer, it's, it's uh, again, you know, it's, uh, it's not just say I do it. It's just say I actually do it, <laughs> which is quite different. Uh, it applies also on, uh, on everything that we, that we do in life. If, if you're a mentor, you know, you can just say I'm a mentor. I'm actually ment mentoring someone. So uh, with this said, I am very glad that, uh, that we had this conversation. I hope it's inspiring somebody to lead the change and especially, uh, you know, uh, become part of either your initiative or any other group out there. You've been very, very uh, inclusive in mentioning all of them. Uh, luckily, we, we know most of them. We have talk on a podcast or another with with some of the people you mentioned so we're all in this together and i hope that this small contribution of 31 minutes can help to make the difference as well and uh very appreciative of everything you you do and uh, i know there was supposed to be some other people on the on the conversation but you did an excellent job covering for everybody so thank you we so all much know work happens thank you so much for having especially us in this time. industry i'm not gonna go yes. into detail but there was an incident and you know you, you're on call so <laughs> pretty much <laughs> all right awesome so thank you very much everybody stay tuned subscribe there'll be a lot more conversation where uh this comes from so take care everybody bye bye Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. 
Learn more at blackcloak.io. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Society, hosted by Marco Cipelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.